So please uh, come and, and sit, if you can, and join us for this in really enlightening part. Um, this is the part for those of us that work in rights where if you really enjoy uh, getting into the nitty gritty of, of contracts, uh, but it's my distinct pleasure. Uh, you've heard some of the storied success of, uh, from Sarah in terms of, uh, and you saw pictures of their great list in both the children's side and on the adult side of the various uh, foreign editions that they have been able to sell in terms of rights. Uh, one of the people that's been instrumental in making that happen is standing before us, Barbara Hausen, who is um, um, well known to many of you, but she is one of the people in those two houses who's been instrumental in ensuring some of that wonderful financial success, obviously working in close collaboration with a really great team at uh, Anansi Groundwood. So please welcome Barbara Hausen, who's going to talk about Let's Make a Deal. Hi, um, so I'm Barbara Housen. I'm the, say, it says right there, you can read that. Um, okay, so we're going to start with, I think, a fundamental question of um, everybody when you're going to the fairs is what to sell. Um, and we publish, well, at Anansi and Groundwood, we definitely publish a variety of books. We publish fiction, nonfiction, kids' books, adult books. Um, we publish uh, poetry, we publish cookbooks, um, and some of them will travel and some of them won't travel. Um, so I think one of the first things that you need to do is look at your list, and you've already heard this from some of the speakers, is that you need to curate your list. You need to figure out what you're going to sell, and then the next step is to whom you're going to sell it. So I always ask when we have our meetings with um, editorial, what do we think we're gonna be able to pitch out into the world, and I'm gonna sort of focus on the German market for this purpose. Um, so mostly we focus on the fiction, and we do some of the nonfiction that we think will travel. Some of the nonfiction will definitely not travel, it's too Canadian. Um, but the fiction, I think um, you need to be open-minded about it. And I'm going to hold up this book called The Break by Katharina Vermet. And this is an extremely Canadian book. It's an indigenous story. It's written by a Métis woman from Winnipeg. It's set in Winnipeg. And at first glance, you would think this will never travel outside of Canada. And so this is why you have to be open-minded about what you think can travel outside of Canada. So we have sold German rights, we've sold Spanish rights, we've sold UK rights, and we've sold Bulgarian rights. I'm always fascinated with some of the odd things that happen. So I think that's like what I'm saying is you need to be open-minded about what you have, but also be aware that stuff is just not gonna work. Poetry tends not to sell much outside of Canada, and that's fine. Um, graphic novels are actually quite difficult in German, Germany. They, have, um, they do have uh, some graphic novel publishers. Um, they do sort of publish the classics. I'm gonna be really interested to see how Carlson does with the graphic novel based on um, Anne Frank, which they published, I think, in the fall 2017. Um, we've been trying to pitch the breadwinner graphic novel, and it's interesting. There have not been um, huge uptake on that in Germany, which I'm finding very interesting. S interesting. Um, so, you know, there are things that you need to look at your list and sort of focus on what you're going to concentrate on, because as you've already heard, you have finite time at the fairs, and so what you should do is look at your list and see what you can really, really sell. Another example is Sidewalk Flowers. So Sidewalk Flowers is this wonderful book. Um, it's beautiful illustrations by Sidney Smith, and it's wordless. So why would you sell a wordless book into, I think we're up to 15 different languages. So, and that did what very well in Germany and sold very well in Germany. And I think it's because it has universals, and that is the other thing I look at when I'm looking at my list. Even if it has a Canadian topic, this is like so Toronto, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, but it has universals in it. It has um, the, the father who's the distracted father, the celebration of small but important things. Um, it's the same with Katharina Vermette's um, book. It has, it's fantastic writing, but it's also got universals in it. Women struggling against um, societies, um, mores and things like that. So, and that transcends anything that is just specifically Canadian. So when you go back to your 
offices and you're starting to put your lists together on what you're going to sell at Frankfurt this year or in, in 2019, look for the universals. Look for those universal themes that you think can travel. Um, and that's where you should focus, in my opinion. So do you do it yourself or with a sub-agent? Um, you've heard today that um, some people are very um, active using sub-agents. I have mixed feelings. Um, we do have a sub-agent in Germany. She's excellent. Um, and it's, you know, the pros on having the sub-agent are they have the contacts already. So if you're new into, if you're new into the market, that might be a good place to start with a sub-agent. Um, they should be able to make the biggest deal for you. Um, one check once a year or twice a year, depending on when they send the checks, when you're doing your royalty reports and they send uh, one royalty report on an annual basis. So that can help you if you have a small office um, and you don't have a lot of time to look through um, multiple royalty reports if you're doing multiple contracts. Um, tax form management, these tax forms are like stupid, the government needs to change this, everybody who's doing rights is nodding their head, but you have to do them on an annual basis, and there's a specific tax form for Germany that needs to be filled out, and the sub-agent can help you with that. So if you're new to the business, maybe working with a sub-agent is, is um, the way to go. Um, what I don't like working with a sub-agent is that they're between you and the client. Um, and also, do you know if your list is actually being shown? Um, they are paid on a commission, so obviously they're going to go for the shiniest bauble that's going to give them the biggest money or a bang for their buck. Um, it's not to say that they won't pull your book out, out of the bag, but um, you also need to make sure that you're going to the fairs and that you're meeting with clients too. You will hand over those clients or the contacts or the the, um, the submissions to the sub-agent to follow up on your behalf, but still, it's just, I think, having that personal contact, and that's what we've done so well at House of Anansi and Groundwood Books, is that personal contact with people so that they know that when I'm pitching them something, they know I've thought it through, or Sarah's pitched them, or Janie, or whoever, We've thought it through. We know that this book is perfect for them and um, that we're not wasting their time. So that's sort of the good and the bad working with a sub-agent. Um, if you do it yourselves, as I said, more control, more contact with the end client, and you and the creator keep more of the money. And I think that is an important aspect of, of that sort of direct um, relationship. You know, once you have a sub-agent, they take 10% off the top, um, you've got banking fees, you've got other things so that by the time it gets down to you and then you split it with your, your author or creators, if it's an author illustrator, it gets smaller and smaller. And sometimes these deals are not very big. So the more you can keep, I feel the better it is for your um, client, which is your author and illustrator. Um, Cons, do you have the time, do you have the contacts, and do you have the infrastructure, which I have not put up there, but I'm just adding. So if you are a small company and you're just starting out, you might not have the infrastructure to deal with the different royalty reports, to deal with um, the sending out of materials, to, to not have all of that centralized in one place. So you might need to, at least in the beginning, work with a sub-agent and build up um, your confidence and build up your repertoire and um, then take it on yourself, because I really actually highly recommend that you do it yourself. The deal. So what does a rights deal look like? So this is basically a nonfiction or a fiction book. This can be on the adult side or the kid's side. Um, this has no color in it, so I'm not talking about color. So no picture books here or anything like this. This is when you only have one publisher interested and so you're not um, in an auction. Um, situation. So basically somebody has liked your book from your pitch at the book fair and they've come to you and they've given you an offer. So this is my minimum. What I would like is I want to know what their first print run is. So say it's 5,000 copies, I want to know what their selling price is, less the VAT, and I want to know what their royalty is. 
all of these things, other than the, really the print run and the, and the selling price, are negotiable. The print run and the selling price, I'm relying on that publisher to know their business. And I'm not asking them to do 10,000 copies when they feel that it should be 4,000 or 5,000 for a first print run in the market. We're all aware of books and warehouses that don't sell and all that kind of stuff. So I respect what that publisher has to say about the book. And then that, to my mind, equals the advance once you've done that calculation. The royalty, in my mind, is highly negotiable. Um, and it really depends if it's hardcover or paperback. Um, it can start at 5 or 6%. I don't like 5%. I really don't like 6%. I do like 7% as a starting, just so you know. Um, and then I, what the other thing that, that I like is a rising royalty. I believe if this book is successful, we all should share in the success. And that includes my author and illustrator. So I believe, you know, a rising royalty can be start with like 7% for the first print runs. So say that's 5,000 copies. And then if um, after 5,000 copies, it's seven, it goes to 8% to 10,000 copies. And then from 10 to 15, it can be eight, nine, or that nine thereafter. It really depends on what you're negotiating and what the book is. Terms. Um, so this is the terms for the advance payment. So it's 50% on signature and 50% on publication is the norm. However, if this is a small deal, say a thousand euros or under, I prefer to get 100% on signature. Now a lot of people argue with me on this, but what drives me crazy about the 50% and 50% is that you've got the bank fees, you have the exchange rate, and all that kind of stuff which eats into my end money. And though in my contracts it says that we don't pay the bank fees, we always end up paying the bank fees and I just can't be bothered to go back and argue with the publisher that I shouldn't be paying the bank fees in my bank. Um, so I try, if it's a thousand bucks or younger, or um, younger, a thousand bucks um, or less, I try and do 100% on signature. Um, and then I argue strongly and sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Um, so here you can see the typical royalty and then terms. Now when I first got to um, Groundwood, they were actually giving books away for copyright. No. Um, it is a term. It is a license. I only give it for um, five to seven years. It depends. Um, I try and keep it as, as um, short as possible, so I do try for f five years. Um, seven is Five or seven is kind of the norm now. It used to be 10. Um, and that's not to say that the, the publisher who has bought it doesn't get to renew. There's always a clause in the contract which says it's renewable on mutually agreed terms. So it's not that to say that they can't have it after the five or seven years, but then what I can do is I can see how the sales are, and if the sales are really good, then I can get another advance when I renew it, which I like. Um, or if it's not, but they you know, just want to have another six months to sell off stock or whatever, then I can just you know, renew it for another year. The other thing is that in your contract, you should always have a clause that has a termination clause. Even if you are on a term, it should still have, if they're not um, you know, a certain amount of books in stock, if they're not, um, it's not in their catalog, whatever you want to put in your contract to make sure that they are actively, and that for me is the key, that they are actively selling your book um, in some way. And that is not based on the ebook either. It has to be based on the print book in the catalog on their website. And, that, and sometimes I even negotiate that they're selling a certain amount on a yearly basis. And that can be between, I don't know, 150 to 200 or maybe less. Are there any questions? Wow, I stunned you into silence. Brilliant. Okay, to print or not to print? Barbara, yes. Quick yep. When you put the royalty rates up there, is, was that a net royalty, list royalty? It's on the selling price. All selling price? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Less VAT. You always have to make sure there's no taxes included. Um, there are clauses, of course, if it's over a certain, I mean, it's like in our contracts here, if it's over a certain discount, it would be on net. But this is sort of into the regular trade market, and it's what you base your advance on. I don't do it on the high discount. Okay? To print or not to print? This is Buddy and Earl, and you'll notice in Germany he's called Buddy and Carl. I do like things like that. It's kind of fun. 
Okay, so this is for people who are working in with picture books or um, adult books that have color. Pros, um, you're able to save money with a bigger print run. You've got quality control, good for overall relationships with your printers because you are printing more than just what you're printing at your house. So the more you print, the more um, opportunities you have to negotiate with your printers to get better prices from them. Cons, um, have you created files that can be used in co-editions? Do you use printers that know how to do co-editions? Um, do you have time to manage this process? So once again, it is a very time-intensive process. I'm a firm believer in trying to do as many co-editions as possible because it helps me with my print costs. Um, but it does and can stretch your resources in your production departments, um, so and maybe design departments too. So it is something that you have to be very clear about whether you can manage in-house or not. Any questions? The contract. Okay, so if you're using a sub-agent, um, I would use the sub-agent's contract. I would review, review it first. Um, I would make sure that you have a good template that you can both agree on. Um, but the, the, the nice thing about using a sub-agent is that they will have certain things that are necessary for the German market already in their template that um, makes your life easier if you haven't done a lot of contracts in the German market. Um, so once that template is done with your sub-agent, then the sub-agent will just use that for any deals that they do. If you are doing this um, yourself, you should use your own contract. That way it saves you time because you know what the minimum terms that you want in your contract, and that's everything from you know, the, the term, from the rights you're granting, from the sub-licenses that you're willing to grant, from when the reversion rights you're willing to uh, put in. I mean, some of them will be negotiable. Some of, them, um, some of those terms, such as the royalties and the advance, um, are negotiable and will change, but there are certain things that shouldn't change. One of them is approvals. One of them is, do you have approval over the cover? Um, you know, with Katharina Vermette's book, we have approval over the cover, and we have approval over the t title change. Um, and I have to say, one of our sub-agents neglected to follow up on that, and one of the de the Editions is not quite to the author's liking, and given the sensitivity of the material in this book, I just emailed our German sub-agent and said, when is the German edition coming out? I haven't seen a cover, I haven't seen the title, and I haven't seen the translation. I want to remind you we have approval. So um, approval for that kind of thing is, I think, very important. The other thing you might want to put in that there's no ads in unless you approve um, ads in the book. Um, this is probably for more commercial rather than literary presses. Um, you might want to um, make sure that um, there's clauses in about ebook rights that you can change terms if the standard terms change. Um, um, and you maybe can look at ebook rights in two years or something like that, so you can put that in your contract. Um, but whatever you do, make sure it's standard so that you're not reviewing your contract all the time. And if there are changes, one of the th key things that I put in my emails to um, clients is that this is not, should not be considered precedent. So if I agree to a subsidiary rights clause that they want, I don't know, um, say they want um, audio rights, and then I do another contract with this same publisher three years from now and they don't execute or don't use the audio rights, I wanna make sure that I don't have to give them audio rights again. So if you use the term not to be considered precedent, then you can always go back and refer to that email and say, we agreed it for this contract, we are not agreeing with this going forward. And that way you, you have the flexibility of changing things if you need to. Um, yeah, and then at the end, one of the clear things that you need to do is a reversion clause, even with a set term. And this is um, really key for me because if they are not actively selling your book, and say, for instance, with um, McMafia is a perfect example, we were actively selling that book, but if we hadn't been, and then 
you know, me as a rights person, I'd be sitting looking at a Nancy and going, you're not actively selling this book, and I know that, not that I'm telling a Nancy this, that there's a film deal coming, I might want to get the rights back and sell it to somebody else. So not that I would do that to a Nancy, Sarah, it's okay. <laughs> but it's, it's something that you really want to make sure that the publisher that you've licensed with is actively selling your book because your job is to look after the author's interests and your job is to make sure that, that, that the author's rights are being exploited in a way that um, gets them the most money. Any questions? Oh, we're going to get through this so quickly. Oh. And what do you mean by digital? Um, if they want to publish a, a, as an e-book or if there's a possibility that that book might go into some kind of uh, online library or something like that. Nowadays, I, I mean, I think it's pretty standard to hand over e-book rights. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, in the, if I'm doing English language contracts, it might be slightly different. I might not give some subsidiary rights away um, that might, such as your, your online library, I might want to have my book up in the world, um, not the UK publishers, if I feel like they can't. But with German, I would probably be more willing to give away more rights. Why is that? Because I can't utilize them. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do a German edition. Just to add to that, we wouldn't sign contracts that would give away e-book rights. Yeah. I, I, I don't know of any deals really that I'm not giving away ebook rights now. Audio, I might hold back now because we're doing our own audio. Um, and that's not necessarily a, a deal breaker. But once again, if it's a different language that I have no intention of ever publishing in, why withhold the rights? As long as I know that they're actually going to um, um, use them. One of the other things you can put in your contract is if they haven't used them within a year, the rights revert. Not that I would do that with an ebook because that would just happen, but if it was audio or if it was any of the other subsidiary rights, I might put a clause in that they have to say. I do this with Spanish language contracts. If they haven't published the book in certain territories I, within a year or if they haven't sold a certain amount within um, uh, a year, I will ask for those rights back. And that's really clear for me if, if I'm doing a deal in Spain um, and they want Mexican rights, but then they never put it into Mexico or Colombia, which is actually quite a thriving market. But Germany, it just doesn't really work that way. It's not the same. Oh, there we are. Questions, you and your future. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, with covers, do you, do, you, do you often get approval of covers in English contracts? I definitely try for it, or it, yeah. I mean, especially if there's something like this that is I'm hypersensitive about, um, and I feel that is very important to the author. Um, and you know, to my mind, that sort of this is what treads on uh, moral rights a little bit. Um, not that that's in the contract, and not that I can control moral rights because I don't own them. But I just feel for certain subjects that if. At the bare minimum, I should be consulted. But this one, I have asked for approval. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, no, no. I was supposed to have the title approved. I was supposed to have everything. And that's the sub-agent, um, we'll be talking to the sub-agent of London. It was not the German sub-agent. Um, but, but, I mean, we went back and forth a couple of times with the publisher, but unfortunately it was too late. Um, so it was either we, the book was not going to be published or we agreed to it. Yeah, no, it was not an ideal situation. <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, so we decided with, in consultation with Katharina that we would go ahead. But it was not an ideal situation. And that's, you know, even, I mean, this is on the sub-agent, quite frankly. This is what they get paid for. And I was very disappointed um, that it happened this way. Um, and that's when you're working with a sub-agent, you don't just meet them at London and Frankfurt or Bologna. You do need to be in contact with them. You do need to follow up with them. You do, you know, they are busy. They're representing more than just me. 
Um, and so you do have to be kind of that pebble in their shoe a little bit and um, remind them that, you know, where is that contract? Where, where is that? You shouldn't have to do that. But I also know people get busy and things happen. So you just have to make sure that you're on top of it. Yes, Kate. Well, I, I, I tend to go with um, publishers that are established. Um, I won't do a deal, and I know I have granting people in here, I won't do a deal if the, the deal is only, if the publisher will only sign up um, because of a grant, a translation grant. That, to my mind, is a red flag. If they will only publish the book based on a, and I, that's happened a couple of times, um, that people have come to me and said, yeah, we'll publish it, but only if we get the translation grant. And I'm going, well, I'm moving on. Um, if they're not willing to hear me about the cover and the, and, um, the title over certain things, then I will walk away. Um, and if they're, yeah, I think it's just really, it's, if I have never worked with them before, I do phone other Canadian publishers, and this is where it's really good to be tight with your colleagues, and I will phone up and say, have you ever worked with these people? Or I will ask for, especially if it's um, somebody I've never worked with, um, I've asked for um, people to recommend them. So I get sign off from, from people that they have worked with in the past, that they've paid their bills, that they send uh, royal, royalty statements in a timely manner and stuff like that. Um, and I have no compunction about asking for that. Um, I do also have a clause in the contract that says if the contract's not signed within a month and um, the um, advance is not paid for within, I think, t two months, then the, d the contract is null and void. Because I have sent out the contract, chased the contract, and the contract never come back signed, which I never under quite understand why that is. Um, so I have, I have that clause in my contract to make sure that I can just walk away from the deal if it's not signed for whatever reason. But yeah, there's no, I think because we're so well established, there's nothing that I would, there's no red, Sarah? No. I, I, I can't think of anything that would be a huge red flag for me because we tend to, we tend, I mean, this is the other thing with rights, is you do tend to go back to your same people that are interested in your list because, you know, we're not publishing things that are so different that, you know, maybe when we started doing cookbooks that we could have gone to some new people to, to sell the cookbooks, but generally we're publishing fiction and nonfiction, and that's what people know us for, and we have a stable of publishers that we're gonna go back to again and again. Yeah. No, she says, thinking. Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think the thing is, you have to be reasonable, and, and I will backtrack on certain things. Um, but it also, it's, it's knowing what is your bottom line and what do you value. And I value protecting the author's rights. And if there's certain things that I will just not agree to um, because I feel that it interferes with um, how I serve the author and, and the illustrator. And I think as long, and I, when I, what I worry about with people doing deals is that they, they are not willing to walk away. They're not willing to say, this is, this, this is not enough money, this is not the terms that I agree to, and, and know your bottom line. I mean, a deal is a deal, but a bad deal is not worth your while. And if you do have a spidey sense, I mean, when I was at Kids Can, there were some, I, there were some, I don't know if you, I won't mention them, but there were some people that we did do deals with, and it was more trouble than it's worth. Um, they, they didn't pay on time, they did, and we did all our due diligence, but it just didn't work out very well. Um, the books weren't 
printed in a nice way and all that kind of stuff. So I think it is important to know your bottom line and stick with it and not be afraid to walk away. And I do feel that sometimes people are afraid to walk away from a deal and I think that's a mistake. Which is one of the reasons why I put the clause in if you haven't signed a contract within a month and then I just don't want to deal with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The question is, do I put a clause in that is, if the book's not published in, within a certain uh, amount of time, um, then the rights revert. Um, 18 months is standard for a translation, but if I feel that it's um, a book that is um, timely or needs to be published within a certain amount of time, I will put in that it has to be done in six months or it has to be done in 12 months. Um, it really depends on the book, um, but that is standard as well. And most people agree to it. Yeah. I just wanted to comment on her, her standard, really standard. There's nothing especially stern about it. It's, it's just a very standard deal. And um, also from my side, I would have nothing to it. So have, I, I have nothing we should do more to deals on. then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, I didn't put up, I thought about putting up a whole contract, but I did not. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of different clauses that can sometimes go in and sometimes go out. I have a different contract for um, when I'm sent, selling a file. I have a different contract for, for if it's just rights. Um, I have a different contract if it's a co-production. Um, so, and there are certain things that go into the co-production contract that will never appear in a rights contract because a co-production is based on a time. If they don't deliver the files, if they don't show up for the printing at a certain time, then my deal will all fall apart. And so there's, there's time limits in there. So there's a whole bunch of different clauses. There's a really good book by um, Lynette Owen called Selling Rights. And um, she also is, uh, uh, and it's hugely expensive, and you look at it and go, is this really worth it? It is. Um, and then there's another book, um, it's a British book, so it is based on British um, contracts. And um, I can make sure I get the name to Catherine, but it's basically, it gives you a template for contracts, rights contracts, merchandising contracts, film contracts. Um, and it actually gives you like the file so that you can put them and use them. Um, and I use those a lot when I first started at Kids Can because their contracts were really bad, but not anymore. Um, so um, so these, these are really good basis on which to develop your contracts if that's the way you want to go. Um, but, you know, the deals all start at um, the fairs and getting out there and making sure that you're meeting people. One thing that everybody was saying is that you need to have PDFs. I, I do want to point out that last year at Bologna, we had this really, really, really great little middle grade novel called The Goat by Anne Fleming. And when the book came in, the package was so beautiful that I actually took 10 copies to Bologna. And I got people really excited about this book that by handing out the finished copy that I had an auction in Germany. So, you know, people wanted to actually look at the package because the package is so beautiful. So yes, a PDF, definitely most people want a PDF. Most people do not want the hard copy. But sometimes when you have a particularly stunning book, that you want to share with people, sometimes having the finished copy there and maybe having a few extra to hand out is, is really the case. Um, our next book with um, Sydney Smith was called uh, Town is by the Sea. And I had this Vanna White thing going because um, under the jacket was a completely different image. And people were just wowed by it and wanted the book. So, you know, part of doing the deal is sort of the sh showmanship of, um, being in love with what you sell. We're not selling widgets, we're selling books. And they're meaningful um, on so many different ways. And even if you don't like them, and sometimes I don't like them, um, I like all of yours, Sarah. But um, it, you, you can find something that you like to sell about it. Um, and then your job is to figure out who in the world, and it's a pretty big world. And when you go to Frankfurt for the first time, you realize how big the world is in publishing, it's kind of scary, um, who will like your, your book. And there should be somebody who likes your book. And then the, 
the, your job as a rights person is to make sure that all the way down through the process from signing the contract to getting the advance to making sure that book is published in a way that is appropriate for the author and the illustrator happens. And it's fun. It's always Christmas when we get new books in from different countries. Um, and it makes, yeah, see, Stella and Sophie. It's really interesting that they changed the names, but there you go. Okay, yep. Yes, so that's that's definitely, and um, for Frankfurt 2020, we have a whole new program. We actually, for the kids' side, for the first time, they're going to help us with the production costs, which we're really excited about, because up until recently, kids' books were sort of, um, except for the fiction, were not helped by any of the programs, um, but now we have a production program. So yes, I do. I definitely... Um, make it part of, I, I talk about it, I don't make it part of the deal, I really feel strongly it shouldn't be part of the deal, but I do want publishers from around the world being aware of the program and um, accessing it, because that's what it's there for. So yes, we thank all the grantees. Yeah? You mentioned the auction, how does that auction um, so, how does an auction work? There are many auctions. There are many types of auctions. Um, in this particular case, what we did was we asked for best offers. This is, I find, the easiest way of doing auctions. So, we had various publishers come in and, and um, say that they were interested and they gave an offer. And then what we did was we went back to all of them and said, okay, we have multiple interest. And you know, a week from now, or if I can't remember what we did, maybe four days from now, we would like your best offer. And um, you know, we'd like it by noon Toronto time. And you know, tell us what your royalty rate is, the advance, um, your pr print run, your marketing plan, and um, give it to us by a certain date. And then we will review them and get back to you. So that is what we ended up doing. But there are different ways of doing auctions. I just find that that's the cleanest and the easiest. And the one clear thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that everybody knows you're in an auction situation and that everybody knows not necessarily who is they're competing against, but um, um, that there is a set date and that you don't favor one over the other. So you don't say, you publisher, I like you better. Can you please, you know, do better and give any hints. You have to be open, you have to be fair, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, oh, there was something else I was gonna say. Um, yeah, I can't remember, but the, yeah. Does that answer your question? It's really a quick, because there are so many ways. Do, um, do I have a sense of the success rate um, for the people applying for the translation grant? I have no idea. Have you ever had any like Not that anybody's told me. Do, has anybody told me whether they've been turned down? And I don't recall that. So the original translation program is 30 to 40 percent success rate? Okay. I mean, I always tell people um, that, that it's not guaranteed and that if it, I believe if it was an award winner, um, you're, you get more points or whatever, you have a higher chance of success rate on the original program. Have I been lying to people? Okay.
Right. Yeah, I was always really clear with the translation grants that they should apply, but it's not guaranteed. So if they want my book, it, that's not the reason to buy my book. There's so many other reasons. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Barbara, that was absolutely superb. Uh, you more than met expectations as, um, as we knew you would. And I just want to say thank you very, very much for having taken the time to pull together such a comprehensive um, uh, presentation and to share so many of your very useful um, and informative uh, bits of advice, counsel, tips, whatever you want to call it. And obviously Barbara provided her email and phone and she's here. Uh, throughout the day, so you'll be able to um, gently uh, corner her, uh, maybe <laughs> take, a, take a name. Oh, aggressively, says Sarah. Okay, anyway, uh, we have reached the end of the morning, and uh, you people are hearing very nicely to a time, um, uh, so we're not running over at all, but this means we have a little more time to enjoy what I hope is going to be a very fascinating, lovely, delicious lunch. Uh, just to say that for those of you who have... Um, uh, specified a particular lunch, your name will be uh, on a, uh, you'll, you'll see it, there are salads, there's a full range of things, but specific uh, dietary um, requests are there with the name tag, otherwise the rest of you uh, are the, uh, there, and the, it's a buffet style at the back, uh, sort of side of the, of the uh, room as you come in, up the ramp. Uh, just a reminder to those who might have come in and missed the early housekeeping tips, uh, we, washrooms are up the ramp to the left. Um, and I think that may be all at the moment. Um, thank you very, very much, because we just have a good round for the people that presented.